How's it going guys? My name is Dom and in today's video I'm going to be showing you how to create a reaction time game using HTML, CSS and JavaScript. So this right here is what the game is going to look like. As we can see the user is able to have a turn and when the box changes from red to green they need to click it as fast as possible. The amount of milliseconds that they take to click on the green square, that is going to be their score and it's going to appear on the right side. Now I think projects like this uh, cater mainly towards beginner JavaScript developers but you never know, you might learn something even if you're more comfortable. And also just quickly, if you guys missed my last previous few videos, I'm now uploading courses to Udemy. My recent course was a JavaScript DOM crash course which I think is perfect for beginner JavaScript devs that want to build confidence in the DOM as I go through uh, quite a few core concepts. And if you're interested, my Udemy profile is going to be linked down below. Okay, so let's jump into the code for this reaction time game. Okay, so jumping into the code, we can see here I've got this index HTML inside this new directory. And I've also linked up a main.css file as well as a main.javascript file inside the head of my HTML. Now, it's very important you guys also use the defer attribute inside your script tag if you're going to be placing it inside the head. This just means that the JavaScript file is only going to execute once the document has been loaded and it's going to avoid any errors with uh, being unable to find HTML elements and so on. But we're going to be getting to that towards the later parts of this video because the first two steps is going to be to write the HTML and the CSS before finally moving on to the JavaScript, all right? Now, Inside this HTML file, I currently have nothing inside the body and I've only set a page title. Inside the CSS file, it is empty and the same thing goes for the JavaScript file. So we're going to be starting from scratch. Okay, cool. So let's begin by writing out the HTML for the reaction time game. So we're going to be creating a new div right here with a ID of app. So this is basically just the main container for the game itself, all right? Now, inside the app, okay, if I go back to the example from the beginning of today's video, we basically have these two sections inside this area. We have the main, you know, click area, and we have the area to, you know, list the score history. So, Let's go back inside here. We're going to need two divs inside the app, one for each area. So firstly, let's make a new div with a class of click-area. This will be the main red and green square. Now, inside the click area, we're going to also need uh, a way to display some text to the user. So it says something like, as an example, your time was and click to play again. So. Uh, to display that text, we're going to be using another div inside here with a class of display-text and we're just going to say here, welcome, okay, click to start. So this right here is going to be the default text when the user first loads the page. We can now drop down here underneath the click area and we can make a new div called recent-scores and this right here is going to of course store every single uh, recent score with a maximum of five. So let's list every single score just like this using divs once again and we can just say dash for when the page first loads up and we can copy this under, uh, further four times giving us five divs right there. So we are done with the HTML for this reaction time game. I'll save this, go back in the browser, go inside our HTML file here, and we get something like this. We have all of the dashes and we have that display text showing. So now it's gonna be up to CSS to convert this right here into something like this right here. So. How do we go about doing that? Well, going back inside the text editor, let's now head inside the main.css file. So first off, we're going to be targeting the ID of app. So for that primary container, we're going to be using CSS Flexbox to position those two columns for the, uh, for the click area and the score history. So we'll say display flex. Now this one line, if I save this, go back in the browser, we now have all of the dashes appearing on the right side. So we automatically have this two column setup. Let's now expand on that. We're gonna be setting a width of 500 pixels and a height of 300 pixels. 
And we're also going to be setting a font family here of sans serif and a font weight of bold just to apply these font properties to every bit of text inside the app container. All right. I'll save this, go back in the browser and we end up with something like this. Okay. Let's now move forward and drop down below the app and we're going to be targeting the class of click area for that main red and green area that the user is going to click on. Now, we're going to be setting a flex grow here of one. This just means uh, because the click area is a child element of the uh, parent app, uh, combining flex grow of one with the display flex up here is going to make sure that this area or this click area is going to expand as much as it can uh, in terms of the width. Okay, I'll go back in the browser and we can see now it's going to expand all the way out to here. All right, cool. Back inside here now, we can also uh, essentially uh, use uh, Flexbox to then uh, center the text vertically because currently uh, the text is up here, right? So it's, it's at the top of the actual container. So let's push it down to the center vertically. We can do this by setting this as a display of flex as well. So we have a flex box for the main parent and also a flex box inside the click area itself. So for this one, we can say align items of center. I'll save it, go back in the browser and we get this right here. So now if we inspect this, we can see that the text is uh, centered vertically inside the container. All right, cool. We can now set a background here. We're going to be using hash 9500000 for a dark red and finally a cursor of pointer to finish off the click area. I'll save this, go back in the browser and we have this right here. Cool. Let's now go back in the text editor and just minimize these two and then drop down below to begin styling up the display text. Okay. Now, we're going to be setting firstly here a padding of 24 pixels. This is just to ensure there's always some space around the edges um, of the uh, you know click area uh, where the text is. Okay. We can also set a width of 100% here to ensure the text has you know the most possible space to expand. A text align of center is of course going to center that text. I'll just stop right here, go back in the browser, and we end up with something like this. If I inspect it, we get that full width, we have that padding, and of course the text is centered. Going back inside the CSS file, we can also set a font size of 24 pixels to make it a little bit larger. And lastly, a color of white to make it stand out and make it a little bit more uh, legible. Back in the browser and we get this right here. Cool. We can now move on to styling up the recent scores. So I'll just go back in the index HTML to just demonstrate or show the HTML again. So we've just styled up the click area and the display text. We can now minimize this and move on to the recent scores section. So for the recent scores uh, container here, it's going to work in a similar fashion to uh, the above two in that we're going to be using flex. So we can say display flex right here. This is now going to allow us to create a five row um, sort of column where each item is going to be equal height. So going back to the original example, we can see that every single row inside this column has an equal height. So that's why we're going to be using flexbox here to achieve that same consistency. Going back inside the CSS file, we can now say flex direction column, and this is now going to create those rows. All right, let's go back in the browser and we don't get much of a difference here because obviously we have rows already. Um, if I was to inspect this right here, we can see we currently have this going on. So we need to of course expand those widths and heights and we're gonna to get to that very shortly, but to finish off the recent scores, we can also give this a width of 125 pixels. I'll save this, go back in the browser. We can see now that section is a little bit larger, okay? Just like this, right? So it's taking up a set width of 125. Now, in order to ensure that any text on this side doesn't then push this area aside, we can use a flex shrink of zero. And this just means, look, this width right here is not gonna change under any circumstance when it comes to other content pushing it aside. All right, cool. We can now work on an individual score itself. So one of those five scores from the recent history. 
When it comes to these ones, we can use a flex grow of one. And much like in the above example with the click area, this is going to make sure that every single score takes up the same amount of height and it's also going to ensure that um, no other space is being left out at the bottom of the uh, column, all right? We can also say here a display of flex, okay? And align items of center and a justify content of center. So these three properties combined are going to ensure that the text inside the score is gonna be centered vertically and horizontally. I'll save this, go back in the browser and we get something like this. We have that width applied or, you know, we can see here we have, you know, uh, the centered dashes. And of course, it's also going to uh, take up the entire sort of height of that column right there. Okay, just like that. Cool. To finish off the score, we can set some padding. We can say padding here of 16 pixels just to ensure we have some extra space, uh, you know, at the edges uh, as per usual. And lastly, we can just say uh, target the class of score once again, colon nth child odd. So we're saying here, look, for every odd score, we're going to change the background color. We'll say background and make it a light gray with triple E just like that. I'll save it, go back in the browser and we end up with something like this. So now this looks exactly like this one aside from the font difference. So I'll quickly show you guys how you can uh, include a new font on your web page. So if you head to fonts.google.com here, I'll leave a link to this below. It's a massive repository of open source fonts which you can use for your websites. So as an example, I'm gonna choose Open Sans right here. And since we are only using uh, the bold font weight, as I set it in the app container right up here, we only need to select the bold font style. So if I was to go down here, I can say, you know, bold 700, I'll say select and now it's gonna generate these HTML link tags for this font. If I copy the code on the right side here, I'll just um, a bit of a zoom in for you guys, if I can, there we go. So if I copy this code on the right side here, then simply paste it inside the head of my document, just like this, um, I can now use the Open Sans font. I'll go back in the CSS and I'll say font family, Open Sans, comma, Sans Serif, save it, go back in the browser, and we now have the Open Sans fonts applied, and these two now look extremely similar, aside from, of course, the content inside the elements. So, we are done with the CSS and the HTML. Let's move on to the most important part, the JavaScript. Now, when it comes to the JavaScript, we're gonna begin by defining some constants. We're gonna be retrieving some HTML elements and also making some variables to keep track of the current state of the game. So, let's firstly retrieve all of the HTML elements which we need to interact with in the JavaScript. So, we'll say, const click area equal to document.query selector, then passing through here the class of click dash area. And we're gonna do the exact same thing twice more, uh, this time for the display text to of course notify the user of their score or you know if they can play again and so on. We can say here the class of display dash text, just like that as well as another constant called score elements. Okay, so this right here is actually gonna be, it's gonna be a query selector all because there are multiple score elements. So there are five score elements here, which we need to of course update using JavaScript as the user plays the game. So we're gonna retrieve every single score element using query selector all. And this right here is very similar to a standard array. Now, we're gonna also define a new constant here called score history. It's gonna be an empty array. So this right here is responsible for holding uh, the user's score history. So if they were to, of course, play the game, they get a point or, sorry, they get a new reaction time from their game, right, or their, or their attempt, it's gonna go inside this array as a new element. For example, uh, 140 milliseconds, and it might be, 320 milliseconds and so on. So this right here keeps track of the user's score history. 
Now, the next two constants here are gonna be, be a place for us to store magic numbers. So, or not store magic numbers, but we're gonna be using it to define some, some really basic constants. So, we can say here, uh, minimum milliseconds, okay, till change equal to 3000. So, this right here is just saying, look, you know, when the when a new game starts, it's going to take a minimum of three seconds or 3,000 milliseconds for the color to change from red to green. Now, the maximum time it will take is going to be 10,000 or 10 seconds. So like I said, just storing these values up here within constants so you can easily change them later on and you don't need to go through the code. All right, cool. We have all of the constants set up. We can now move on to defining some variables which tell us the state of the game. So let's drop down here. I'm gonna say let uh, milliseconds uh, since epoch on time out. So this right here is probably a poorly named variable, but basically it's gonna tell us how many milliseconds since epoch uh, at the time in which the color changes from red to green. So this is used in the calculation to find out how many milliseconds the user takes to react. So it's gonna make a lot more sense towards the end of this JavaScript section. Uh, but for now, let's define that variable right up there as well as the second variable here called waiting for click. This is gonna be defaulting to false and basically when waiting for click is true, that just means uh, we're waiting for the user to click on the green area once it has changed from red to green. So once again, these are gonna make a lot more sense as we you know, go through and begin coding um, our game right here. So. Let's hop down below. We can now define a function called play. So when this play function gets called, it's basically the beginning of a new turn. So we can say function, and we can call this one, like I said, call it play. Now, inside here, we're gonna need to uh, immediately define how many milliseconds it will take uh, for the color to change from red to green. So there are two sort of uh, areas of this uh, JavaScript code here, which involve milliseconds. The first one is, like I said, defining that time for it to change. And the second time we're using milliseconds is when we're trying to measure how long it took the user to, of course, click the square. So this first one here, milliseconds till the color changes, we can say const milliseconds till change, okay? Equal to, and we'll say here math.floor, math.random, okay? Then we can say times, and then inside here within brackets, we can simply say maximum milliseconds till change minus minimum milliseconds till change. Then simply add at the end of this plus minimum milliseconds till change. So this is a very long line of code with heaps of characters, but basically this one here is gonna generate a random number between 3000 and 10,000. So math.random, we're gonna multiply it by our basically 10 minus seven, so sorry, 10 minus three, so seven seconds. If this happens to be seven, we're gonna add three to give us 10. Okay, that's, that's, that's basically how it's gonna, you know, give us that range there, as opposed to having something like a zero, because if the color changes straight away, that's not fair. So that's why we have this minimum here to prevent a instant change when we begin playing the game. So MS2 change is now gonna be that milliseconds till it should change. Let's just console.log here, uh, MS till change, and then immediately call the play function. I'll save this here, go back in the browser. Going inside the console here, we get 5754. Let's call play again, okay? We get 7574, we keep doing it, and we can see here we're gonna only get numbers between, like I said, 3000 and 10,000. So, we have the code ready to define, or we now know how, how, you know how much time to wait before changing the color, okay? Now, when you begin to play a new round, we're also going to uh, remove uh, the current background color. So we'll say here, click area.style.backgroundcolor, okay, is equal to null. So, what's happening here is, because if I go back to the uh, original example, 
the color is now green because the user was meant to click on it, right? So at this point in time, uh, we need to revert the color back to red. So on the first go, this line of code won't do anything. This line of code is more for any go after the first one. So this just means, look, revert the color back to red. And the reason why this works here is because uh, by setting it to null on the inline style, it's gonna fall back to the CSS, which is the background of red, of course, giving us that red background. Cool. We can also say display text dot text content equal to an empty string just to immediately uh, remove any text which displays in the center of the square. Back in the browser and by calling the play method as we did straight away on the bottom here, we can see the text is now you know gone. All right. Let's hop back inside here now. We can now get to the interesting part where we can say set timeout. So by calling set timeout, it allows us to run some code after a set amount of milliseconds. So this function inside here is gonna run after milliseconds till change, of course, our random number. So at this point in time, we now need to change that color back to green or change it to green, should I say. So we'll say here, click area dot style dot background color equal to, I'm gonna use the decode green here of 009578, okay? Then I'm gonna say waiting for click is true because now where, you know, the background is now green, so let's, let's wait for the click from the user, okay? One last thing to do here is also gonna be to set the milliseconds since epoch on timeout. So we'll say here date.now. Okay, date.now is gonna give you the amount of milliseconds since January 1st, 1970. When the user clicks on the green square, we're gonna compare this value to the current milliseconds since epoch or you know, Jan 1st, 1970. So that's how we're gonna find out the gap and how much time uh, the user has taken to of course click on the square. So let's just stop right here, okay? We're gonna call the play method or the play function straight away. So go back in the browser, I'll hit refresh here. We're gonna wait between three and 10 seconds here. Okay, keep waiting. It's green, so now we have waiting for click is true and milliseconds since epoch on timeout is this large number right here. Okay, if I was to do, for example, date.now minus milliseconds since epoch on timeout, it's been 17 seconds or 17,000 milliseconds since this code has ran. Okay, so that's the reaction time if I was to click on it when I called date.now. So, in all this being said, let's go back in the JavaScript here. Now we can remove this play and replace it with an event listener on the click area. So we're gonna react when the user clicks on the main area. So we'll say here, click area dot add event listener. We're gonna add the click event just like this. And we'll say, okay, cool. The user has clicked on the, you know, on the massive area. If we're currently waiting for them to click on that area, we can do some logic. Otherwise, if they're not playing or they're not you know, waiting for the color to change, we can simply call the play function. So now, because waiting for click is false on page load, this part should run. Let's go back in the browser, click on the square and the text disappears and it's now waiting to change to green and there it goes. Cool. So let's go back inside here now and write some code inside this block here um, to of course measure the user's reaction time. We're gonna say const score is equal to date.now giving us that millisecond since 1970 once again minus the one we saved from earlier inside the set timeout. So between this point in time and this point in time that's their reaction time, all right? Cool, we can now say waiting for click is false. They are no longer waiting to click or we're not, okay, waiting. 
Then we're gonna say display text dot text content equal to, now using the back ticks on the one or near the one on your keyboard, we can use JavaScript template strings here to say your time was, then we can pass through here using the dollar sign and curly braces, the score, then it will say milliseconds, exclamation mark, click to play again. If the user clicks again, it's now gonna go down here and of course repeat that cycle. I'll save this, go back in the browser, click on this, and we're gonna test my reaction time. So hopefully it's not bad. That was not bad. So 449 milliseconds and we can see it, click it again and it's gonna restart the game. So we've got the main process down. We now need to work on the score on the right side. So going back inside here, once I've clicked on the square when it's green, we're gonna call a function called add score. Add score is going to take through the score which the user has just received. So we can now define this function called add score. And as the name suggests, it's going to simply add the score to the right side. We'll say function add score, accepting a score in milliseconds. Okay. Now with this one, we're going to say, look, score history dot unshift and pass in the score. Now, score history is from earlier on where we defined that array of scores, okay? Unshift is going to add the score to the array. Unlike push, which adds it to the end of the array, unshift adds it to the beginning of the array. So basically, your most recent score is always in the first index of the array or index zero. This is important because by doing it this way, their most recent score is always going to appear on the top of the right side. Okay. So add score to array in index zero. Okay. Everything else is going to be pushed uh, to the side. So one step down. Now, dropping down here, we can say four, and we're going to be using a four let i loop this time. We're going to say four let i equal to zero i less than score history dot length i plus plus we can say here const score is equal to score history at index i so we're just simply looping through every single score inside the history here and now of course score is a number in milliseconds from the user's score history okay we can now say all right score elements so the array of five elements right up here Score elements at index i is equal to, or my mistake, dot text content is equal to. And we can just say here using template strings, once again, we can say score and then in milliseconds. So we're looping through the array, we're adding, uh, or we're then grabbing the score element. So one of these five divs here at the corresponding index and updating its text to be the score and then in milliseconds. Let's save this, go back in the browser here. I'm gonna play the game, click on it and wait a bit more. Something like this, 371. And of course it's appearing on the right side. Let's do it again, okay? We can see the power of unshift where it's gonna be at the top of the list now. When I click and something like this, hopefully, there we go. 342 is at the top. So it's the most recent score. Now, the problem is the array length can exceed five. So we're always gonna keep adding to the array. So it can exceed five and of course five is our max. So we can simply call the JavaScript math.min um, math here, okay? We can say math.min score.history.length otherwise five. So now this is saying, look, we're only going to loop over the array up to a maximum of five times. If the length of the array is three, it's going to be, of course, three. So zero to two. If the length is like 10, then it's going to use five. So we're just getting the minimum of these two numbers here. We're shifting us to five entries in the score history. And we're basically done. So you can now play the game. It's going to keep track of your scores. And of course, it's not going to exceed uh, a maximum of five scores on the right side.
And that is all for today's video, guys. Hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, make sure to drop a like and subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one.